It's a pleasure to welcome Controller Galperin. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to, uh, to share this with you this evening. Um, I want to go back to uh, 1902 for just a, a brief moment, and that's when uh, the DWP actually was the privately held Los Angeles Water Company. If you read the headlines of the day, there were all these conflicts about rates, about underinvestment in infrastructure, and about the lack of accountability, and that's actually what spurred the creation of the DWP. Does any of this sound familiar? So all of this brings us to 2016 and the pressing need to make DWP more adaptable, more nimble, more responsive to its customers. And in December of uh, 2015, our office as a joint administrator along with the uh, mayor's office and along with the uh, CLA issued the Industrial Economic and Administrative Survey of DWP, something that the charter requires that be done every five years. And that included a variety of different recommendations, including looking at uh, some possibilities for governance reform. And I'm very glad that the subject has been taken up, and hence we're here this evening. And also thank you so much to the leadership of our mayor, to uh, Councilmember Fuentes, and to all the others who are involved in this effort. Now, in order to properly fashion the most effective and the most meaningful reforms, it's really vital that we evaluate the problems and that we also look at what the opportunities are. Now, DWP gets a lot of criticism, and occasionally it's come from me, uh, but it, it's important that we keep things in perspective. Uh, if you look at our own IEA, the Industrial Economic Administrative Survey that I mentioned, what it makes clear is the department does a good job of consistently supplying competitively priced water, really high quality water, by the way, and power to the people of Los Angeles. I know, thankfully, when my own power went out just about a week and a half ago, it actually went back on really quite quickly. Thank you very much, Marcy. Um, and I didn't even have to call her. Uh, uh, at the same time, as noted in the IEA, the DWP has been handicapped in a variety of ways because there's no really single uh, entity or coordinated group to set policy, provide specific goals, metrics, monitor performance, and to hold the DWP accountable. This is despite the fact that, by the way, there's some great people who are uh, on the board, great people who are in management, great people who work throughout every single level of the DWP. So the question is how we harness all of their efforts. And DWP clearly needs to be unchained from a lot of the bureaucracy that exists in the city. Actually, I'd love to unchain the city of all that bureaucracy. Uh, but simple contracts, and, and this has been mentioned by the mayor and by so many others, can sometimes take one to two years. Hiring and personnel rules make it difficult to recruit and manage uh, staff, and particularly managerial staff. It's sometimes even a miracle that things get done. And yet, you, you open up your tap, and there it is. You flip the switch, and there your lights go on. And we kind of take a lot of that for granted. Uh, but in a, in a way, it's a small miracle, given all of the challenges that uh, DWP actually faces. And also, the question is how we can strengthen the role of management. Uh, and, and this has also been talked about by, by a variety of folks. How do we really give the management of DWP the tools and the power, quite frankly, that they need? So I'm anxious to see reform at the DWP, but I'm also going to note a couple of caveats. And first of all, there's the issue of politics. And there is those who would like to say, well, we need to get politics out of the DWP. The reality is you're never going to get politics completely out of DWP or completely out of any entity, nor is it altogether that desirable, because that is a way to have some accountability. The question is how you mitigate some of that politics, how you make it uh, less uh, uh, less burdensome, how you don't involve, for example, the council in, in so many different contracts of the DWP, but still at the same time maintain that kind of accountability. And we also have to make sure that we avoid unintended consequences, because you have a lot of people who are working and very dedicated at DWP, and you want to shake it up a little bit, but you don't want to shake it up so much, so quickly, that you create chaos, not for the people who are there and not also for our uh, uh, those who are investing in our bonds and, and those who are watching everything that DWP does. 
So where do we go from here? A couple things. Number one, I think it's vital that we have an open process. And by the way, this is an incredible uh, part of that process. Thank you so much to uh, Rafe, uh, and thank you so much to everybody who has organized this. Everybody who knows Rafe knows what a, what a brilliant mind you have when it comes to everything having to do with the city of Los Angeles. Um, these kind of town halls, I think, are, are really vital. The involvement of neighborhood councils, which is where I came from. Uh, I think it's also really important to be informed so I'll give you my little advertisement for the evening, which is if you go to our utility panel at the uh, controller's website, you'll find literally hundreds of different kinds of measurements and metrics. And it's important that we follow these numbers so that we can make really uh, informed decisions. I believe in empowering ratepayers. Uh, we're sort of past, for the most part, the debacle, as it were, of the billing. But I got to admit, I still don't understand my bill half the time. And we have to find a way to really empower ratepayers to understand and to better make decisions about their own water and power use. And also, there's of course going to be a discussion about the uh, power transfer, which uh, I know has been the source of a lot of controversy. I will admit to you my own conflict of interest here, because on the one hand, I want to see the most effective DWP and see that they have all the money that they need. At the same time, I also represent the interests of the city of Los Angeles and know the impact that that would have if we didn't have that money. So there is my own conflict, to be frank. But I believe that we are uh, going to be able to get past all of these because there's some great minds and great incentives to see change happen. It's uh, an honor to be a part of this and uh, to uh, be part of really making change at the DWP and throughout our city of Los Angeles. Have a great evening and thank you so much to all of the panelists. Thank you, Controller Galperin. As a US historian, I particularly enjoyed starting in 1902. <laughs> Seemed like a sound place to me. Our next speaker is City Councilman Felipe Fuentes, who represents the 7th Council District. Council Member Fuentes was elected to the State Assembly in 2007 to represent the 39th District, which includes the majority of the Northeast San Fernando Valley. Prior to being elected to the Assembly, to the assembly Councilman Fuentes served as the Deputy Mayor of the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles, and later as Chief of Staff to then Los Angeles City Council President Alex Padilla. Growing up in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, Council Member Fuentes attended local public schools and graduated from San Fernando High School. He later earned a degree in political science from UCLA and an MBA from Pepperdine. He currently owns a home in Silmar where he lives with his wife Lena and their daughter. Council Member Fuente likes to spend time with his family, working on their garden, this is my favorite part, tending to their chickens and sharing home-cooked meals. I'm not gonna ask about the chickens and the males. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Council Member Felipe Fuentes. True story about the chickens. Uh, in fact, we didn't have to, actually this is the first time I've had to buy eggs in a long time because dying brown or blue eggs don't work so well, so you need white eggs. Um, Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for your participation here tonight. Show of hands, how many students in the audience? Okay, well I lost a bet. I thought for sure, Rafe, that you made all of your students have to come. Uh, so that's gonna sort of disarm the, the plug that I have for the City at Stake book. I really do think, uh, Dr. Sunshine, that this ought to be required reading for anybody who intends to serve in the City of Los Angeles. You all. Uh, will remember the secession conversation that the city of Los Angeles had and before all of that, the charter changes. Um, and this book does, I think, an amazing job of speaking to how it is that one should change a charter if you uh, endeavor to do so, and I do endeavor to do so. I introduced a motion in January to, I think, officially kick off the conversation on how it is that we reform the Department of Water and Power. And I did so for a lot of different reasons. I am um, a big fan of the utility. I think it does a tremendous job. Uh, and in the legislature, I had the honor of serving as the chair of the Utilities and Commerce Committee, which gave me the ability to see how other utilities, uh, investor-owned utilities, worked. And in every sort of rendition of utilities, you identify a couple of things. But the thing that was overwhelmingly clear to me is that the utilities that perform the best 
honor this governance principle that is pretty much well accepted and exercised probably could be done so better in Los Angeles. And that is that the utility has a fiduciary obligation to convey its responsibilities in a way that enhances and protects the value to the rate base. A fiduciary obligation to enhance and protect the rate base. Now that means a couple of things to me. It means that what we should probably do is have a system in place that makes it so that every decision that we make is one that is in the interest of the utility. Now that's difficult to divorce sometimes from the politics of the day and certainly from some of the policy agendas and goals that are set, different than the mandates that are required of us. So there's this tension built into how the Department of Water and Power operates today. And I think that if we were able to work better towards that definition, then I think everything else really falls into place. So what I thought I, I would do as a, start, a starting point for the conversation is basically suggest that we look at five different areas uh, for reform. The first being that we professionalize. Now, let me uh, also say that I think that the people that serve the utility do a phenomenal job. I think that the commission that gets uh, asked to serve real stewards in the city of Los Angeles. I think our intentions from a policy perspective, I think are very well uh, intentioned at the, at, the, at the outset. So it's not to disparage any one person or office, but it is to say that I think the rules are stacked against the current commission. So I'm suggesting that we do five things, that we professionalize the Department of Water and Commission. And when I say professionalize, to me, it means full time and free from the ability of their removal uh, based on political influence. Now, I think there's ways for us to get to a way that makes it so that that's comfortable for folks. But I think that we need full time stewardship of the utility. It's overwhelming when you look at everything that the utility has to go through. And to think that you have to do that from a part time perspective, I don't know how these folks do it. The second thing that I would do is or suggest that we uh, look at is that we figure out how to divorce the personnel functions from the city of Los Angeles from the utility. What ends up happening is this ping pong match between the city of Los Angeles and the Department of Water and Power. In fact, there's two sort of unicorns in the city of Los Angeles I hear about all the time. First is the one day civil service appointment. If you can get that one day civil service appointment, you're set for life in Los Angeles. I've never met somebody who's gotten that one day civil service appointment, but that's the idea that uh, sort of is, is out there. But the thing, the second unicorn, is that if you can just slide across the finish line and get to DWP, you're set for life. And so I think that says something about the dysfunction that exists between the two systems at the city of Los Angeles and the Department of Water and Power as it relates to personnel issues. The thir third thing that I would do or suggest that we look at is, I think this commission would benefit tremendously from independent legal and policy analysis. Today, that's not the case. You get every once in a while accompanied with a file, a CAO, a chief administrative officer analysis, but it's not a certainty. So I don't know how directors or commissioners can ever make the best decisions possible when they don't have analysis that affords them a couple of different options. They literally are managed, in my opinion, by the utility and not managing the utility. The fourth thing that I would suggest that we look at is figure out how to streamline the process between City Hall and the Department of Water and Power. I should not have to act as a rubber stamp. It's not that I enjoy doing it, but we lose time, we lose efficiencies, and honestly, I don't have the ability as chair of the Energy Environment Committee to modify anything that the utility sends over. I, I get the opportunity to affirm or deny, but not change. So I'm not, and no future uh, committee uh, person, chair, will be in a position to really give you any real benefit by having so much travel back and forth between the utility. I would still give us the ability to uh, assert jurisdiction over decisions so we can give it a thorough vetting, but I would streamline that process. And the last thing that I, that I suggest that we do is figure out how to remove politics from City Hall at the utility. And there's a lot of examples, but let me just sort of share with you sort of at a high level what I think the danger is. 
When you have goals and agendas at City Hall, very good. But you have to temper those with the mandates that the utility has to work with. So there's this tension between what it is that we want to do versus what it is that we have to do. So to end, if we just had in mind this idea that we have a fiduciary obligation to convey the best value and protection for the rate base, I think all of it becomes very simple. But the way that we do things now, I think, make it very difficult for the commission and anybody else for that matter to be able to say with any real certainty that we're getting the best value. Now, we're doing a great job. The utility, as the mayor mentioned, is doing an awful lot. We have an engineering perspective on how it is that we service, and that's a good thing. We do have to focus more on customer service. But this is more than just making the experience for the ratepayer better. This is about making sure that we're accountable, more transparent, and ultimately enhancing the value of the ratepayer and his, his or her participation in the rate base. So Rafe, thank you so much for starting this conversation in a public forum. I'm looking forward to, as the mayor suggested, a lot of robust conversation, but equally important, making sure that we inform Angelinos about this process. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Fuentes. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce someone who needs no introduction, Dr. Rafe Sonnenschein, the Executive Director of the Pat Brown Institute at Cal State LA. I've, who here doesn't know him? I'm, uh, primarily this evening, it's mostly been how long have you known him? Um, Rafe is a, is a real powerhouse for us at Cal State LA. He's a noted professor, author, and expert on the governance of Los Angeles and the region. He served as executive director of the appointed Los Angeles Charter Reform Commission that helped create the 2000 Charter. He's well known for his charter reform work for cities throughout the region. He's written three books. You've already gotten a plug for one. We should have had it on sale on the way out. Regarding city government and the relationships among racial and ethnic groups. He's been at the Pat Brown Institute since 2012 when we were fortunate enough to snatch him after a 30-year career at Cal State Fullerton teaching political science. It is a, a great pleasure to both speak before him, I hate speaking after him, and to introduce Rafe Sonnenschein. Hello, everybody. I feel like we're at Civic University again. Great to see everybody. Um, I just want to thank a few people before bringing our panel up. One is the staff of the Pat Brown Institute, which uh, did a tremendous job of uh, putting much of this event together. So if we just hear it for our staff, they're around, still working. And also, I just wanted to uh, ask you if you want to know the hashtag that everybody's using. It's called. Uh, um, DW, hashtag DWP reform. I get instructions from the staff and then I write them down wrong when I get up here. And then at PBI uh, is another thing I'm supposed to say. Um, we all know that the department is the largest municipal utility in the United States, nearly four million people. I won't go back to 1902 since Controller Galpern has. Next year though, it will celebrate its 100th anniversary providing power to the city of Los Angeles. Uh, it's one of the two most recognizable and often controversial departments when you think about the LAPD, which is known worldwide, and the DWP, which is known here and throughout California and throughout the West. And both have all been the subject of tons of reform efforts and have even appeared in movies and on television. Uh, probably the LAPD more on TV shows, but the DWP has been no slouch in the media department in terms of drama. What other city has two such dramatic departments as the LAPD and the Department of Water and Power? I'm from the East Coast and there's never any drama in the department, so it's, it's pretty exciting. Well, DWP reform is in the air again, uh, which is, makes me very excited. There's a lot of discussion about amending the charter, uh, and I want to thank the people who really got the ball rolling. Uh, Council Member Fuentes, Mayor Garcetti, Controller Galperin. Somebody has to get the ball rolling on this because otherwise things just drift. And the whole history of these reforms is if somebody doesn't throw something out there that people can react to, nothing will ever happen. But what often happens is 
at this stage of the charter, people get really nervous, and they say it's all over before it even started. Well, I'm here to tell you the one simple truth about all city charters. Nothing happens in the city charter, not a word of it changes unless the voters approve it. How many people in this room are voters? Okay. Since about 25% of the people vote, you are four times more likely <laughs> than other people to have an impact on this. Nothing changes without your vote, which means you're actually in charge of the process. The mayor and council or the voters can put a charter measure on the ballot, but only you can approve it. Uh, it can be contentious, and there's some disagreement here, but back in 1997 and 99, there were actually two contending charter reform commissions because the mayor and council couldn't talk to each other, and that worked. So the fact is, these things can really work out if you really take the time. Now briefly, before I bring the panel up, a few basics in the sort of civic U model. The Department of Water and Power is a proprietary department, meaning self-supporting. It's mentioned several times in the charter, but most of it you can find in sections 671 through 684. Perhaps you're unlike me in that I find the charter almost like reading a novel. I think that's a rare um, sort of thing. It, it never gets dull for me. Um, it's governed by a five-member board of commissioners appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the council for staggered five-year terms and removable by the mayor alone. The general manager appointed by the board with approval of the mayor and council runs the department on a day-to-day -day basis and can be removed by the mayor subject to appeal to the council. The city's personnel system applies to the department's roughly 8,800 employees. In most years, the city council, by ordinance and with the approval of the board, transfers a portion of its power revenue to the city budget to help pay for city services. That's under section 344. Rates are established by the board but must be approved by ordinance by mayor and council. The reason I list all these things is I've largely now listed the governance features of the Department of Water and Power. When you're talking about reform, you're talking about governance about which of these things should change. And they're all in the charter, and none of that can be changed without uh, a vote of the people. So with that in mind, I would like to ask our three distinguished panelists to come up and take your seats. Your names are right there, so you should know which one is yours. And I'll introduce each of you, and then we have some discussion. And there will be time for some audience Q&A. Before that, we'll have a discussion of what is meant by the word Q. Uh, what questions are in q and A? I I know we have to get through this a little bit, uh, but we'll get to that when the time comes. Uh, Marcy Edwards, who's sitting in the middle, is the general manager of the LA Department of Water and Power, the first woman to lead the nation's largest municipal utility. <clears throat> For those of you who like to see how a career path can work, she began at the department in 1976 as a 19-year-old clerk typist and worked her way up through a series of positions where, as I recall, Marcy, you were the only woman holding a number of those positions. Is that correct? Um, continued to move up and uh, eventually w moved over to Anaheim where she ran the utilities there for 13 years, became city manager, and then very smartly the city pulled her back at a very top level to head this department. It's hard to imagine anybody more suited to this incredible position and difficult position than Marcy. So welcome, Marcy Edwards. Good to have you with us here today. Uh, Tony Wilkinson heads the committee that oversees the information sharing and transparency agreement. You've already heard about this from the mayor between the neighborhood councils and the Department of Water and Power. How many people here have any involvement in neighborhood councils? Yeah. Quite a few people. So you all know the significance of the relationship between the neighborhood councils and the DWP. He is a member of both the Panorama City and the North Hills East Neighborhood Councils, active in the first 5LA Tobacco Tax Money for Kids program, retired from a business career, that included experience as a business economist, marketing services manager, and information technology manager. Uh, welcome, Tony, and thank you for being with us today. Let's welcome Tony. <clears throat> when somebody's been your boss, even if it was a long time ago, he'll always be your boss. Uh, George Kiefer is a partner in the law firm of Manat, Phelps, and Phillips, been honored many times 
uh, as among the top 100 lawyers in California. You know, those things you see in Southwest when you're flying in in the magazine, it lists all the lawyers. Uh, George is one of those. Uh, he's been honored many times as among the most influential attorneys in California, but most important to me, he chaired the Los Angeles Appointed Charter Reform Commission, one of the two commissions between 1997 and 1999. Uh, it was the first revision of the city charter in 75 years and required diplomatic negotiations between the two uh, commissions that rival global politics that we see today since the two commissions essentially hated each other uh, for a very long time. But George and Erwin Chemerinsky did a brilliant job of crafting that agreement. He received his BA from the University of California, Santa Barbara, his law degree from UCLA, and you've probably seen his picture in the paper lately as a member of the Board of Regents of the University of California, and he currently chairs the LA Civic Alliance. So George Kiefer, welcome. <clears throat> I'm going to ask some questions of the panelists. I've asked them to be brief in their answers. Um, and we're going to move things around a little bit. And I'm going to try to push and, and pursue. I sent the, the, this mailer somehow went to Warren Olney. And he wrote back and said, it sounds like which way LA. Uh, won't be as good, but we'll certainly try our best. If you go to the doctor before you get the medicine, you probably want the doctor to ask what's wrong with you. You want to have a diagnosis of the problem before looking at solutions. And I've promised our panelists that the first thing we would do is what you should always do in any reform effort, which is ask what you think are the most serious problem about the DWP and potentially about its governance that needs a cure. By the way, there will be plenty, but it's important to start with a problem, and then we'll work into some of the solutions that we have heard. So Marcy, how about you? What do you think is the number one problem to be solved? From my perspective, it is a lack of ability to make productivity enhancements. The agency has become incredibly bureaucratized. Many of the policies and procedures that are put in place are not directly under the control of DWP. And, and anecdotally, what I say is I need permission from 100 people to buy a box of pencils. <laughs> it's not an effective way to run a railroad. We have significant challenges in procurement and in hiring that create enormous costly inefficiencies. I need to resolve those because I need to hold down any rate pressure on the, the rate payer. Well, then let me pursue that. That pencils thing is kind of interesting. Really, what can you be more specific? Tell me about that. There, <clears throat> the lines between how many uh, groups need to approve it are basically set arbitrarily. If it takes three years and 150,000, it ends up going to council. But that includes an enormous number of purchases that are routine in my industry, that general managers in Sacramento Municipal and Seattle City Light have you know, multi-million dollar approval authorities for things that are part of our business, buying polls. The, one of the biggest challenges we have with personnel is we have different goalposts. The personnel department is focused on parity and opportunity, which I appreciate and needs to be integrated in any hiring plan. But as an example, when I came on, you heard the referenced 45-minute wait times. It peaked at two hours. It still took me over 10 months through existing systems to hire customer service reps. 10 months, our customers were forced to endure service levels that no one in their right mind should have to. We need ways to expedite hiring. We need ways to hire specialized individual. I have jobs that didn't even exist two years ago that I need to be able to import industry experts to pick up. Um, the last comment I will make is just and again, anecdotally, on Friday, the manager of our gas business retired. He's not mandated to tell me he's going to. We found out we came in Monday and his desk was empty. <laughs> now, here's the process. I have to offer it to transfers inside the department who get a prescribed period of time to decide if they want it. Then I go to a civil service list. I interview the people with three top scores on a mechanical engineer's list. And I cannot mandate they have any gas experience. So I have to take someone completely untutored, put them in a multi-million dollar position, and hope I can find enough resources to backstop them and train them while they come up to speed. And that happens to me with great frequency. We need more flexibility in hiring. Okay, thank you. Tony, what do you think? Because you're, 
we, put, we created, a, there's a panel here where people are coming from very different perspectives about what might seem the problem. And you've been in the neighborhood council world. What, what do you see as the problem? Well, I, I'm mostly concerned about the governance part. And I'd like to separate the parts in the package that are about governance and the parts that make the department more easy to manage professionally. But the governance has been mentioned not only by the recent industrial, economic, and uh, administrative survey, but for lots of other surveys before that. And the observation has always been that there are too many parts of city government that have some interaction and control over the city's public utility. But in no case do they have direct responsibility for the results. And the only, while well, we've talked about a full-time paid board, and the uh, mayor does support that as one of his uh, uh, principles for DWP reform, that's not really the issue. I'd like to share the, the rather courageous statement of what I think is a very effective commissioner on the current board, uh, Joe Barad, who said in a public meeting, well, you know, unless people downtown, unless other members of the city government are willing to give up some power, what you do with the board doesn't make a difference. So we really need the, the issue, and that will guide what we do with the board, is to say what powers, rate making, bond and indebtedness, the actual ability to establish those management reforms, whether it's independent uh, hiring system or uh, the department's own attorneys or an independent contracting system, if you give those powers and authority to the board, then we can say certainly they need more time than they have now. Uh, so, and also when you come to the board, I think there's also the distinction between a fiduciary board, which we have today, and a management board. And whether they put more time in or not, uh, I think that we have to have that discussion. Well, let me, let me pursue back to the problem, because you're, you're thinking of mm -hmm. solutions, which is fine, right. which we're going to get to. So would you summarize that your sense of the problem is too many cooks in the kitchen, too many people from City Hall with a partial role? The reason, the right, which is the reason that actually we are here today is that every responsible party in the city has read all of the historical issues and faced by a general manager who's not afraid to walk downtown and talk to Mr. Mayor, uh, said, okay, this is, we really need to deal with this issue. It's been multiple times, the mayor's done his basic things, as he said, back to basics, and just as he said in his introduction, it's now find time to deal with this issue. Okay. George, for, for the big picture, uh, and the reason I say that is that you participated in a process that looked at all the charter, all the commissions, and gave a lot of thought to that. So I know when you talk about it, it's in that context. What do you think is the problem to be solved? Um, <clears throat> and make well, sure you keep your microphones close to you so we can hear you. So I, I think I, I find some common ground with my panelists here. Um, and I would say, though, I would frame it this way, that there's a huge disconnect between the responsibility given to the general manager and board and the authority that they have. Uh, and that disconnect um, is all the difference in the world. I, I would say that all, the, I, I would, all agencies, all government groups have problems. They all make mistakes. But I think you can trace uh, almost all mistakes at the Department of Water and Power, all issues to that difference between accountability and authority. And I, I think we've, we've not given the general manager the authority to run the department, nor the board to run the department, both below the general manager <coughs> and from above the general manager. And so we've confused for the, uh, for the city, we've refused, confused accountability up with a management up, uh, and we've uh, we've tied the hands of the general manager in running her department. If you could picture a, a football game in which uh, every play is is, is second guessed uh, by the owner in the box uh, calling the plays in, and the left tackle who says he doesn't want to play this game, he's going to go out, and somebody comes in, and the quarterback gets tackled, and then she gets blamed for getting for calling the wrong play when she never called the play. So. That's a big issue, and I think that if that, 
if we attack that issue, uh, it, it would solve a lot of the problems. Well, let me be the devil's but I, advocate. I would say this, this, yeah, thing, this is not easy. I mean, I, when we went through the charter reform, it's not easy. There's competing values on all of this stuff. Uh, but I think that the main value here for the department is to supply reliable, quality water and, and, and consistent energy. And that mission should be the goal of the general manager and board. And uh, as, as long as we build it around that and give them the authority to do that, we're on, on the first step uh, of the right track. Okay. Well, let me be the devil's advocate since you, on this piece, you seem to have a similar view of the problem. What is it that City Hall has to do to be involved for the purposes of accountability? In other words, flip it around a little bit. If, it's, if you're saying it's maybe too involved, if your analogy of a sports team it wouldn't happen, of course, in your case, Marcy, but if the coach is not doing well, it wouldn't happen in my case. <laughs> the owner comes in. And if the people are the owner, what authorities must be kept in the hands of City Hall? For this. I think you need to keep uh, approval of, of rates ultimately uh, in some way in the hands of some body, some elected body, and that's probably the city, uh, the city council. Um, so th uh, there may be limitations on that, that authority. Um, so maybe it's, it's disapproval of rates rather than approval of rates. I think that uh, all this contracting that is done at the low level, $150,000, that, that, that number should go up to somewhere around five million or something that's comparable for this size of an agency. So there's a whole lot of decisions that the council, as Councilman Fuente said, he's not even, he's not in a position to say your yes or no on, that, on these. Take them away. There's a confusion that they've got to approve everything to have accountability, and that's, that's just not correct. Um, so I would just take a lot of those decisions, but, but I'd have certainly rate approval. I'd, I'd prove, the, prove the general manager. I think the mayor should appoint the general manager uh, and the council should be having a big say in approving that. Um, but a lot of these decisions that are passed along, contracts, procurements, and the rest of them, uh, should, be, should be left with a board uh, and with the uh, general manager. What do you think, Tony? Well, actually, I'd, I'd go a little bit further, uh, or maybe not so far, on rates. Uh, I do believe that the board should have the primary responsibility to set the rates, but I think that the elected <coughs> city officials always need the ability to say something isn't right, and with a super majority in city council, call that issue of that board decision back and say, no, that doesn't work. It's basically a veto power. And as long as the elected officials have that, it actually depoliticizes rates to have the board set them because at least as long as we can keep it, the MOU with the neighborhood councils is not really about neighborhood councils. That's the, the secret. Ron Deaton, thank you for the auditorium for, for Ron Deaton, but when he set it up, he was smart enough to know this is about public notice. If the neighborhood councils get 120 days public notice for a rate increase proposal, everyone does. Chamber, everyone in the community does. So that's, if we are able to, the, the board will continue to be a public entity. It will continue to be subject to the Brown Act. It will continue to have open meetings. So I think that all the discussion about the rates happens in a public forum under the board. I just believe that the elected officials need to maintain the ability to say no when something's really wrong. Marcy, what do you think? <clears throat> I think that the electeds as representatives of the people have to maintain the ability to reach in and redirect any aspect of the utility. I think the board and the general manager need to manage the day-to-day -day issues. I think approval levels need to be raised to facilitate that. I will make the point that for me to process board items, it's between 45 and 50,000 per, it takes up to 60 days. And I just processed one where the utility is gonna net $875 a year on fiber lease revenues. Now even I can do that math. <laughs> so there are approvals that are taking place that are frankly a waste of people's money. But the oversight of the electeds, the need to maintain transparency, the need to be able to maintain control 
through metrics to be able to enforce accountability on the board and on the general manager, I think that's critical. Mm -hmm. George. Yeah, I, I, I sort of want to get this, this in because, uh, and I want to respond to the councilman who's, who spent a lot of time thinking about this, but uh, with whom I disagree on a few things, and I want to just point it out. Um, I think that the notion, I, I'll just tell you what I think after watching four mayors uh, and our time with the, where we were actually were headquartered at the DWP for the charter reform effort and learned a lot about the history of the DWP uh, during that time. Uh, I would continue to certainly have the mayor appoint uh, the members of the uh, board, but I would not give the mayor the authority to remove them. I would put them on for, for terms that are set, either five, somewhere between five and seven years. I tend to favor seven, although most people think that's too long, and the reason I do is because I think the pressures for geographical and ethnic diversity and the pressures to find people with talent um, are going to make it easier with a seven-person board than five, but I'll accept five. Uh, it should be a set term. It can't be removed except under, uh, uh, under uh, very serious circumstances because um, I want to get that board to have their own confidence and run that department as a board. Uh, where they, not the mayor, Mr. Mayor, hire the general manager, and the, mayor, the general manager is, re, is accountable to the board. So now the, the, the general manager knows where she's coming from, relates to her board. Um, I agree with the councilman with respect to uh, the personnel issues. They're, t they're totally different kinds of requirements in that group. They need to have a different set of personnel rules. Uh, I would not make them full-time, certainly, uh, I would not turn them into five uh, additional CEOs who will simply interfere, uh, and they will not be the people that uh, you want them to be in that role, um, and I would not, so I would not give them staffs to turn them into ad additional CEOs. I think he's correct on the council role, as you pointed out what that should be, and your inability to make judgments about contracts that come before you. Um, and uh, in getting politics out, I think that I, I think that's, a, I wouldn't necessarily phrase it that way uh, because I, I think there's always going to be some politics uh, and politics is the accountability mechanism. Uh, but I think if, I think we need to focus on the mission and not get confused by submissions. So there's a, there's a mandate for this department to provide water and power. There are lots of other values to bring in. But that's got to remain the number one, and that's the board's job and the general manager's job. And I think that if you focus on that, uh, you can get away from some of those other issues that, that kind of detract from, that, from meeting that mission. So yeah, I'm Marcy. sorry to put all that out there, Rafe, but I, I thought if we're going to talk about this, there are different views on how to mm -hmm. structure that, and, and that's the accountability chain that I think mm -hmm. is important. Marcy? I, I do want to make the observation that it is important for the board to have additional independent input. The, though the way I would go about it is not necessarily, and I don't mean to be positing solutions at this early juncture, Rafe, but, but to add that, I would significantly expand the role of the rate payer advocate. Mm -hmm. When you add staff to, <laughs> thank you, I like the rate payer <laughs> advocate, but what do you want? The, when you add staff to appointed people, it, it it has a tendency to politicize those individuals to a greater extent. The ratepayer advocate is chartered to protect the interests of the ratepayer. I may not always agree with him, and in fact, I have vehemently disagreed in a number of areas, but the fact remains is that's his charter, and so his review can be counted on to be independent. And I would significantly expand that office to give the board the comfort and alternative views of my recommendations that they need. Let me take us in a different direction. I'm going to ask you a question, Tony, okay. which is one of the things we discovered in charter reform is some of the stuff that we thought was most interesting was to many people inside baseball. Yeah. You know, we were talking about the mayor and the council and who does what and, and the overlap, and we thought this was absolutely going to solve everything. But what we heard from people is, what about me? If I'm a person in the community, how does this affect my relationship with the city government? And I think that's particularly of interest to people that are active in neighborhood councils, which is why I wanted to start this conversation over here. Issues like transparency, access, um, openness, uh, feeling empowered, et cetera, has to be part of any reform. So from that standpoint, what do you think is the most important things we should be thinking about, Tony? The open and public process during 
debates such as the issue of the recent five-year uh, rate increase. Uh, this directly, directly relates to the general manager's comment because uh, f I wish we could expand the number of neighborhood council folks who come to the first Saturday of the month at 8.45 a.m., now at the Department of Water and Power, thank you, to talk for one hour about DWP stuff because the inside folks during this last rate process saw a rate proposal made in July, June for actually official July, early July announcement, and then a long period of discussion where you saw the board using the ratepayer advocate, the Office of Public Accountability, basically as independent professional staff and considering, but not rubber stamping, various suggestions that the board made, including the mid-course correction, the additional report backs on are we meeting our targets for infrastructure, and the amount of the power increase request actually went down from the original ask. This process, the people who've come to our committee saw this process going on. So I think that we've got a good process where the fiduciary board relies on the experts, independent experts in the Office of Public Accountability and then comes to their fiduciary from many different standpoints, whether it's from uh, uh, income or uh, uh, parts of ethnically dominant parts of the city or law or finance or whatever skills those individual directors bring, and I think it, uh, more different perspectives the better, they have the ability to use that ratepayer advocate. And I can tell you one thing, I know personally that the general manager has said, oh my gosh, so many times about the Office of Public Accountability that when she comes and says, it's working okay, I support it, it's not because they have a honeymoon. <laughs> so, Well, let me push a little farther because it's not quite where I'm going on this, which is when you're in the community, you don't necessarily see, a f I think the mayor said it, which is basically you could do all the efficiency in the world and you can uh, align the accountability and everything works much smoothly and nobody feels anything. Nobody feels any difference whatsoever. That's really worrisome because you don't want to go to the process of this and not have people feel the change. And so Marcy, to give you an example, you know, if there's a board and then the council is in an afterward role about maybe turning it off, are they going to be engaged in that rate setting process in a way that people feel they've had, a, had an active role, a visible role? You know, the last time they did a single year rates back, I want to say in 2012, there were four major presentations. We did 82 mm -hmm. this year. We were in all four corners. And I will still tell you, I am of the opinion that the community is still underserved. We're coming out of the recession. We're putting more people into our communication teams. We need to be far more proactive with the neighborhood councils and providing not only input, but gaining their suggestions, gaining their feedback. It's something we have not done well, mm -hmm. and it's something we need to continue to focus on. Mm -hmm. I actually want to go back to the mayor's comment about the investor-owned utilities mm -hmm. not doing the same good job that DWP is doing, but spending more on public okay. relations. Right. And that is the first thing that this board should do is expect the department and hold it accountable to do what within her limits the general manager is doing today, which is to try and expand public outreach. Because uh, today, if you go out there, and actually there has been some discussion on this very issue, Rafe, most people when it comes to DWP reform ask about the Joint Power Institutes <laughs> and you know the training institutes. And while that's a real issue and the controller has been a tough guy on it, and I thank you for doing that. Um, it's only solvable through negotiations with our labor partners, and it's not a giant money issue, but it's a big symbolic issue. Symbolic so issue. I, th I think that we need to acknowledge that there are lots of symbolic issues, and we have to actually take those to the public and discuss those in conjunction with the issues that may be bigger dollar issues mm -hmm. so that people feel they have the 
big picture of the department. George, what do you think about that? Yeah. How do you reach down so that people feel that there's somebody in public office or in government that they can go to shake things up and say, I've had it under a reform system? How are you going to be able to preserve that? Well, I think you still, I, I think what Marcy's done on this outreach has been terrific, um, and it, it takes the neighborhood councils to help her do that. Um, uh, glad we put them in the charter. Um, the, uh, the, the, the opportunity to go and complain to the city council is always going to be there, and I think you have to retain the ability, as, as has been said, for the council to reach in at times and make a course correction. Um, but I think we can be distracted by a lot of these things as well. Um, it, we're at, a, we're at a point in time where there's faith, where the trust in government across the government is at its lowest point in a long, long time. And so actually we're at a difficult time for reform where we're going to ask for a, a leap of faith in some ways amongst council members, amongst the mayor, amongst the CAO, the CLA, all the people that think they are responsible and accountable and need to look at everything. And uh, it's going to be difficult, I think, in some ways. Uh, because of that, uh, that absence of trust. But we're going to have to begin to trust the people that we put into positions of authority, hold them accountable afterwards, uh, but don't run them through all sorts of hoops as a means to keep control or to think that that is going to improve the situation. So I think that you can't do it without the transparency that, th that creates the trust uh, and allowing you to let go a little bit, like letting go a son or a daughter uh, to grow up a little bit. And the reason why I would have the board have the authority that it should have, you've got to empower this board to feel that they're responsible, that they're accountable to the public, and they're not just a representative. Um, and that's not this mayor's issue or any other. I've watched you know, four mayors operate on this way, and, and I think that representative role d diminishes their authority, and their sense of responsibility, ultimately. We're going to take some questions from the audience. How many people would like to ask a question? OK. Uh, where are our microphones, by the way? Can you hold up your hand if you have a microphone? We have how many? Two total? One on each side of the room? OK. Now, uh, we are going to bring you the microphone, uh, or have you come over. Um, we'd like to have questions, uh, brief questions, and just remember that a question um, has a question mark at the end. Um, <clears throat> and an easy way to know if you've got a question mark is your voice goes up just a little bit in an interrogative manner. Um, a speech usually begins by saying, I have eight points I'd like to make. Uh, we probably would rather not have all eight as fascinating as they are. But uh, who ha who, where are our microphone holders? Would you please identify yourself and ask your question? And I will also, if you don't mind, help direct the answers to our panelists so that everybody gets asked and participates. Hi, good evening. My name is Dennis Kanya. I have eight points I'd like to make. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll leave, it, I'll leave it to two questions and maybe one point. My question is to Ms. Edwards, and it's very tactical. You had mentioned about the procurement process about you need 100 people to buy a, a box of pencils. You had also mentioned, there was also a mention about uh, the $125,000 signatory authority should be $5 million. My question is, who makes those policies and who has the authority to change them? A lot of them are either reflected in the charter or in administrative code provisions that were driven from the charter. Um, I believe the 150000 and the three years are an administrative code provision. But they have been, as I said, very onerous. We developed potential recommendations for approval authorities by reviewing other um, municipal utilities. Investor-owned utilities don't do anything like this, but, but uh, that's where some of the recommendations um, is, that we're is making Is it something the city council could quickly change? Administrative code. And, and maybe that question is to Mr. Fuentes. The, 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 they, that is in the charter, uh, three-year contracts, and so that, that particular item is going to have to be changed in the charter. And there are administrative code provisions that follow on that are like that, 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 that further limit. 
Uh, other parts of it are actually part of the culture of the department uh, uh, that gets that, that that drives in. You know, you, you create a charter; it's like the bones, and then the culture sort of forms around it with habits. So I think some of those things are also habits, but those ones are in the charter. I have a question back here. Uh, Mac Shorty, Watts Neighborhood Council. How do we, which is Watts, 2.12 miles big, get DWP to support solar energy in Watts? <clears throat> We're in the midst of expanding our current solar programs as well as developing programs that we're referring to as community solar. Because there are portions of our territory that are significantly underserved because we have um, significant numbers of rentals or communities that aren't suitable to be able to put a solar installation on their roof. So we're in the midst of... I'm not sure we've had solar power for 50 years, but... It would probably be something that we should sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one so I can ensure I understand your question. Because I was answering it on solar, it seems like it's broader than that. Uh, I'm looking for our microphones. Oh, okay, back there. I have a question yeah. back here. Okay, um, let's dealing with the our disabled and elderly, the seniors. What do we do about those folks? The rates. We currently have um, low income and lifeline rates. All the information is available online. The um, rate payer advocate has actually suggested we adjust them upwards to, to CPI, and we're currently resisting that recommendation for right now. Uh, we do have provisions in state law that require rates be cost of service based, but we do at the, at the present time have um, subsidies for both those contingents. Go, go past, give the mic. Please identify yourself. Uh, wait, wait, excuse me, sir, but we have a question back here. That's okay. okay. My name is Iris Vales. Sound like to me you guys have an inter problem with how to get your house in order. But my main thing is these rates have been going bad. I have paperwork since 2008. Rates are steady going up. It's not like Metro. If people get on the bus, they don't pay. No matter whatever you give us, we have to pay because we need water and power. My problem is you're going too high. We don't make no money. If we're in a recession, how you guys keep going up? One of the things that, that people are not aware of is that within particularly our water rates, there's something called a pass-through component because we buy your water from the Metropolitan Water District. Over the last five years in particular, their rates have skyrocketed because they've had to access much more expensive imported water, and you've seen that pass through on the rates. Um, Met approved another 5% rate increase here just recently. One of the things we can do is find internal productivity measures that I can drop the cost of doing business inside DWP and therefore try to keep rates down. Which, go, if I could just ask a follow-up question that I didn't give you a chance to answer, which is, do you favor the proposal that rates would be set by the board subject to override by the council, or do you think they should continue to be set by, have the council and the mayor by ordinance be able to set the rates? I think as long as the mayor and council have the ability to assert jurisdiction, if they're not comfortable with the process or the transparency that the board is imposing, <coughs> I would be comfortable with that. But I do think electeds need to be able to exert that jurisdiction. Okay. Um, let's try to get some questions that are about sort of the governance issues that are in the charter. Does anybody have a question there? I, and I'm looking for our microphones. That's why I'm, it may look like I'm not calling on you, but okay, Raquel, go ahead. William, William Shunnawark, today I found out that Sun Edison may fail financially and some of their yield code puppies apparently are involved with DWP selling power. Are there being, or is DWP making provisions for the possible collapse of this house of cards? We continue to work with the solar providers. Um, that one in particular I think is being bought out by another constituent and we're working with them. We allow for that. Anytime you have a business segment that's developing with this rapidity, you have to allow for those kind of implications, and we've considered it as we do business with them. 
George, I have a question for you, because I'm going to intersperse questions with, with everybody's questions, because some of them set some things off. If a mayor, somebody runs for mayor on a platform of changing policy relevant to the DWP, such as the sources of energy, or which has been going on in California and throughout the country, people are running for executive offices, governor, mayor. How would you make sure that if they got in on that promise that they would have, if the board was more autonomous from city government, what would that new elected mayor be able to do if the board, for example, said, we don't think that is that that fits with our basic mission of water and power, we'd rather not change those energy things because it's too costly. Yeah, I think that's a good, a good question. I think and it goes to the heart of, which, uh, of, of what the primary focus is versus what would be very good policies along with the primary focus. So for instance, we have that issue with the federal government. You appoint the Supreme Court. You appoint who you want to appoint. You appoint the FCC. You appoint people that are, uh, that are consistent with your own views. So you do that, um, but you give the, the board a tenure so that they do have a sense of authority and they keep their eye on the ball and, and one mayor can't change the world in one day only to have it reversed the next mayor. So I think it's who you pick, who you appoint to those terms that is probably the most important thing you can do. Uh, and I wouldn't make that the overriding principle over the other values of empowering a board and giving it authority. I guess my question is if a new mayor came in and all the appointees had fixed terms before that mayor and totally opposed the mayor's view on energy, what would happen then, do you think, or what should happen? Well, then? the mayor would work at it, one. Uh, he'd use the bully pulpit on that, the council would. I doubt in this city that's going to happen quite, you know, in terms of in, in issues of renewables. But uh, secondly, he'd begin to appoint people, and, he'd, and, and over his term of four years, he'd turn the board around. It would take him three years to turn the board into his board completely. They'd, be, they'd have terms. So I just think that that's not the value that you want to put above the, the other values that would make the department run a lot better. Tony? Well, actually, that's why I believe in uh, Mr. Fuentes' proposal. It was a staggered board, uh, as it is now, yes. uh, so that the and I side with the recommendation for seven members, because actually that one of the things that allows the board to do is to have functioning committees of three, quorum of two, so you can do more work in committees. But it's relevant because you can, as you point, change the board by appointments. But I do want to say that in all of my experience. There is some commonality in this city, even if we may differ. And just as you'd said, everyone shares objectives both for uh, green energy, for environmental stewardship, for uh, uh, women and minority-owned businesses. If the department were to set up its own contracting system, I am confident it would maintain all of the same objectives that the city now has. In fact, because you didn't have to have a PhD in contracting, you'd probably get more women and minority and locally owned business getting contracts. So I think that we can, that's one thing we don't have to worry about. The people in this city who get appointed by completely different administrations all kind of come with the same heart. Over here. Hi, I'm Wilma Wilson from Sherman Oaks and I'm concerned about the four and a half million dollars Mr. Galperin found in the hands of Brian Darcy. And I am wondering what efforts are being made to get that money and uh, put it to the use it was originally intended for. I would, I would reiterate what Mr. Wilkerson had said earlier that changes to the structure of the Joint Safety and Joint Training Institutes require, require negotiating with our labor partners. However, over the last six or seven months, they have revamped all of their procurement, travel policies, et cetera, and I believe they're operating far closer to their mission now after the value added by the controller's audit. George? Yeah, I just want to point out that, that the negotiations um, with respect to labor in the department, like negotiations with respect to labor in the rest of the city, Go, don't go through the department, per se. They're handled from another body. 
And that body is a combination of the council leadership, the mayor, the CLA, I'm not sure about the CLA, and the CAO. CAO. So this group over here is negotiating regarding items, not just dollars and cents, but work rules and the rest of it, of which they're not necessarily entirely engaged. Uh, probably the wrong group to be negotiating. It should be the, the general manager of the department leading negotiations with, uh, with uh, labor. Well, that would be quite a change. Okay, interesting. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for allowing a resident of the city of Los Angeles since 1958 to come in and listen to me. My name is Javier Nunez, and please don't misinterpret my question. I'm all for labor, and I'm all for good wages. But do you have anything in place now that you could take a look? We, we were talking about accountability. We're talking about being responsible. We're talking about reform. I'm a rate payer. And I think that the Department of Water and Power, and you just mentioned it earlier, that there is a governing body that negotiates contracts, but I think that you need to put together someone, a team, that can look into a composite crew to fix our water lines that the DWP does fix because you need to use the same strategy that your vendors use when they sub when your subcontract work and that would cost that cost would be cut tremendously and that would help my pocketbook thank you do you want to comment on that Marcy? Is that i th i think what the gentleman is referencing is that contracting out can be less expensive than adding to your core workforce which is true what agencies do is you staff your core work workforce to your typical maintenance requirements and then you contract out for those capital jobs and that's what LA plans to do um, DWP plans to do in the next couple budgets Hi, my name is Harriet Arano, and I'm a ratepayer from Silver Lake. And uh, I am personally, I'm concerned about privatization. I know we haven't heard any word about privatization in this in this you know proposal for reform. I'm a little concerned about the mayor's first first uh, comments, in which he said. You know, the, an executive can make snap decisions. You know, well, that's because they don't—they're not accountable. You know, in private industry. But I'd like to hear from you. First of all, your commitment to not privatize, and I see that you're commi committed to make things more open and accountable. But I'd also, can you, can you tell us about whether you can turn around some of the privatization of a vendor, a vendorization of the Department of Water and Power? Um, it's kind of a twofold question. I'll answer the first part. I personally am not a supporter, particularly of privatizing water systems. I think it's a lifeline commodity. I think if you, you turn it over to a private company, um, you see a lot of cross subsidization. You see a lot of detriment to the lower income sectors and you basically lose the control that the people have now over their utility through their um, electeds and through the administration. Can I'm not sure what vendorization mm -hmm. is though. Can, can I make a comment? Yeah, please. It, it's one of the great horrors that I have too is that in some future day, not now, that the city faces a huge economic crunch there will be a temptation to sell the power system. And I think that the best defense against that is to make the governance changes now and along with the management changes that enable the department to be managed as efficiently as a private business so that there isn't huge efficiency that can be brought by privatizing it because our own, we own it, Department of Water and Power is managed just as efficiently as any other giant business with eight or 9,000 employees. So I think that the best defense against that are the reforms that we're seeing today. 
I just want to clarify, there hasn't been any discussion of selling the power system that we I'm know just of, saying, right? the, sharing with the lady up there, okay. occasionally that's one of my nightmares. You're giving me nightmares, so I just and, want to make and, sure the, and the answer to that, so it <laughs> stays a nightmare, is to make the department efficient. George? Well, sorry to give you another nightmare, but I, I, don't, I think if we don't make these changes, there's a risk that the department is going to have much more serious financial problems in the future. And uh, we may get to a point in time where there, there is a movement uh, to, to sell the, the department. And I don't think people would ever want to do that, but uh, I, I think that's, I agree with my colleague here, that, uh, that if we don't make some changes like that, that is a risk in the future. Marcy? Quick story. Back in the late 90s, when the energy crisis was really taking hold, um, LA City made a decision that they were not going to participate in that competitive model. And it was a good decision. It kept LA from blackouts. It kept LA from shipping hundreds of millions of dollars to companies outside the state. Now, however, we are facing competition that we just can't simply put our arm out and say no. I have competitors every day, the Googles, the Teslas, the innovation agents who are reaching over the utility and crafting a relationship with our customer. We need to be able to be nimble enough to partner with those agencies, to offer alternative services, to make the changes we need to make in this rapidly innovating environment and competitive. And we're not structured to do that. So we do face the potential. Because as this department, you've heard of how old a lot of it is, money that's been borrowed historically, you have debt out there that you need to service. Billions of dollars of debt. And as customer owners, it will it'll remain your responsibility. It doesn't just go away. There's no stockholder to pick up that burden. So we have to make sure the department stays viable. And for it to stay viable, it's got to be competitive. And it's got to be ready to meet the technological challenges. And right now, you spend my time churning on $20 contracts. And we're not talking about regionalization and grid defection. And all of the new technologies are taking place. That's where you need me and the management company, frankly, to spend their time. Marcy, there's a question I've been dying to ask you. Oh, um, kind of a sword in the stone sort of question, which is there have been a lot of general managers of the Department of Water and Power in recent years. There's been 11 in 15 years. 11 in 15 years. So I guess I have a couple of questions, which is, A, why is it such a hard job in the last 15 years? And B, what's your personal solution for it not to be untenable for you? What basically will allow you to pull the sword from the stone because it's been hard to survive? I hope you do because you're great. <laughs> the, the complexity of the competing interests have been the most difficult. In a number of agencies, the GM is given specific targets and you meet those or you get fired and you're done. Mm -hmm. Here, you serve so many masters that you're forced to try to find those compromises to create enough critical mass to be able to accomplish even a portion of, of what you'd like to do. I think that's one of the things that makes it difficult. The fact that you're given a lot of direction to accomplish a certain goal, but not necessarily the funding or the resources to be able to accomplish that goal. And the board has to bear in mind that everything needs to be funded. I would love tomorrow to wake up and say, LADWP is going to give you 100% renewable power tomorrow. But the technology is not there. The funding is not yet there. Are we heading in that direction? Absolutely. Do we need to head in that direction? Absolutely. But we have to do it consistent with managing rate pressures and consistent with managing technology. You do not want me spending 30-year borrowed money on five-year technology. And that's what you see happening now because of the kind of perversities of our system. I, I don't know what it takes to pull the sword from the stone. You know, I've been doing this for a ridiculously long time. <laughs> um, but it, it's a fabulous community. I get a lot of feedback. I get a lot of help. I'm, I've been serving the people since I was a kid, and, and this territory resonates with that. They've given me a lot of breaks and a lot of help coming in with that customer service system as messed up as it was. And, and people have been incredibly flexible as we have tried to fix it. But I, I don't know what the answer really is to that. 
Go ahead, back there. Last year, during the drought that we had, um, we were told as ratepayers, property owners, income property owners, that if we decreased our usage, that if we didn't decrease our usage, our bills would go up. According to the LA Times, we not only met your, your requirement, but we surpassed it. People didn't use water when, whenever they could possibly not. And now we're threatened with a rate increase. If you know that we purchase water from Metropolitan, why are we made promises that you can't keep? There is a phenomenon where, well, it's not really a phenomenon, you have fixed costs associated with your water system. It's not all just the water that flows in the pipes. It's the pipes themselves. It's the switches. It's the valves. You need to make that minimum investment. When people conserve water on a marginal cost basis, and that's what our systems are, you hit a point where you start to run into that fixed cost requirement. Nevertheless, the people in our territory saved over $54 million. I understand all that. Mm -hmm. He's going to ask her, and then I'm, going to I'm not sure what, what promises you're you referencing. Rate hikes are to maintain your infrastructure, to meet water quality requirements, and to harden your local system. I was merely explaining that water went up over the last five years because of the increases in the wholesale cost of water. Oh, I wish she was still here to, to hear <laughs> her say that. Yeah, Tony. <clears throat> well, actually, while nothing is fixed overnight, I do want to say that in the current rate proposal, there are more tiers of cost for both water and power. And one of the purposes of those tiers is to distribute the higher costs to the higher users so that it will provide, while it's not perfect, much more equity to those people who actually conserve. That is the people who don't conserve who are going to be hit with the incrementally higher rates for the new tiers. So there is an effort being made to recognize the issue that you're talking about. And, and actually, in uh, uh, Councilmember Fuentes' proposal, the term of the board member would exceed, uh, in some cases, the mayor's term. So. Uh, you know, it's, you know, the mayor might not be here, but the commissioner still is. We have time for probably one or two more questions. That's what we'll give it to. Uh, my name is Gary Kanjan. I'm from Los Feliz uh, neighborhood. Uh, it is very important, uh, accountability and transparency. But before we raise our rates, we have to look our how lenient we are in operation. LADWP is known that they have much higher salaries than LA City. LA City employees, they look every time forward when there is an uh, opportunity to move from LA City to LADWP because the pay is much higher, the pension is much higher, everything is much higher. We have to find a solution between the department, the management, and the union. There's lots of things that, you know, LADWP cannot function is because there are obstacles from the union. For example... Okay, sir, do you have a, do you have a question? Uh, other people do want to well, ask. Well, I'm making your... a comment that, for example, uh, right now, all the water companies, the electrical is, it is an AMI system, automatic reading system, most of the areas, but the water, because of the mirror reading, Union, they cannot go into automatic reading system. And most of the water companies, most of the cities are going into automation. These are things that the board and the city council, they have to find a solution between labor and the management. Okay, Tony? Well, I do want to say that the, uh, they don't want us to the, the mics. Uh, labor partners of the Department of Water and Power have already in the current contract set a new lower pension tier for new employees that is going to make a huge dent. The mayor, I think, mentioned it in his talk on pension costs for the department. And with, help me out, Marcy, 40% retiring in the next you know, five years or something like that, the union has a very strong interest in making certain that it gets new employees for new technology. I know that my meters are electronically read. 
uh, and the department is moving in these directions, and I think with partnership with our union, because they would like their people to be using the current technology too. Nick Pachauras. Ra Rafael, give me a few minutes, indulge me. The Go ahead. You've got, a, you've got the microphone. Yeah. They <laughs> the younger members of the audience should know, unless you know the system, you cannot change the system. And some of the younger generations make the same mistakes that we, the old people, made. One of the biggest mistakes in public, my public service, and George Kiefer will attest, being an old dog too, rail, rail construction corporation of the MTA where experts were in charge of the rail system. And anyone can go and Google the disaster. Ms. Edwards, before you hire additional operators to answer the phone, ask your staff to tell you how in 08, 07, I don't remember exactly, two minutes the phones were answered. So before you hire people, find out how your staff did it. Now, I hear you're going to revise contracting, hiring. I served on the MTA before and after Inspector General. When I proposed the rate payer advocate, the usual suspects eliminated the inspector general function of the rate payer. The rate payer I now advocate, he just validates what the staff says. You have five billion dollar corporation. The waste, a fraud and abuse is rampant. So the key component, if there's a reform, should be an inspector general. Okay. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we are way past our time. And what I would like to do is, first of all, thank um, the controller and council member Fuentes who are here and the mayor's staff who are here. And I hope that everyone will keep up on this debate as it goes forward. And I'd especially like to thank our panelists for uh, wonderful presentations. And have a safe drive home, and thank you all for your attention and for being here this evening. Thank you.